Greetings, everyone, and thanks for downloading this episode of the China History Podcast. I'm your host, once again, Laszlo Montgomery. I'm going to give it away right at the beginning and say we're not going to finish off the Qing Dynasty in this sixth installment of this overview. In fact, I'm questioning now if I can even finish them off in part seven. This one might go to eight. Anyway, we'll see next week, but today we're loaded and jam-packed with historical events of such great impact and significance that you could still feel the radiation today over a hundred years after these events happened. We are going to cover events that happen under two emperors today. First is the Tongzhi Emperor, eighteen sixty one to eighteen seventy five. He was the son of Xianfeng and his Manchu concubine Yehe Nara, who we know as Cixi Taiho, Chinese history's most notorious Dowager Empress. He's just a boy emperor and is gone by eighteen seventy five, living only to the age of eighteen. And then he's followed by his cousin, who becomes the Guangxu Emperor, eighteen seventy five to nineteen o eight. Now, this Guangxu Emperor, who is known in classrooms around the world as Guangzhou,、uh, he really is the last emperor of China. There's one more after him. We all know it's Puyi of the Oscar-winning movie fame. But if you recall from the movie, by the time he's named emperor, it's all over, and he hangs in there as a child emperor for a year, and it's 1912, it's finished, and then we have the Republic of China. In any case, Puyi, or as he is also known, the Xuantong Emperor, is probably best known as the last emperor, Mo Dai Huang Di. You're going to have to wait till next week to、uh, meet him. Only Tongzhi and Guangxu in this episode. And as far as the Guangxu Emperor, we're only going to go up to about 1895 or 96 before we start going into overtime. So I guess、uh, no Kang Youwei、uh, this week. But we do have plenty of foreign powers pushing China around in this episode, and the usual array of interesting characters: Cixi, Prince Gong, Prince Chun, Li Hongzhang, Zhang Zhidong, and of course a whole cast of foreign devils who make this whole quarter century from 1870 to 1895 one of the most unforgettable in Chinese history. We left off last time with the suppression of all the big rebellions of the 1850s and 60s. The three most heroic generals of this period, Zheng Guofan and his two proteges Li Hongzhang,、uh, who defeated the Nian up in the north, and Zhuo Zongtang, who pacified the northwest and parts of Chinese Central Asia. These heroes have vanquished all these military challenges to the Qing. This included the Taiping and Nian rebellions, as well as major rebellions in Yunnan, Xinjiang, and then in 1858 we have the humiliating Treaty of Tianjin, and it's this treaty that causes everyone to put their heads together up in Beijing to plan the next move. The idea was to usher in a period of self-strengthening or Ziqiang. The powers that be naively thought that if you simply grafted Western technology and science onto traditional, fundamental Chinese values and systems, China should be able to enjoy a great leap forward to catch up to the Western powers. That was the prevailing belief:、uh, Chinese learning for the fundamental principles, Western learning for practical application. Was how、uh, Zhang Zhidong、uh, explained it. These ideas were sincere and all, and great efforts were made to modernize. But but the reality of what China was back then had to be taken into account. All of these great ideas and great thinkers were mostly all located in Beijing, Shanghai, Tianjin, or in any number of or in any number of treaty ports along the coast and along the Yangtze. Once you moved away from the safety and comfort of these coastal regions, forget it. You were back in the Han Dynasty. Well. It wasn't that bad, but my point is, China was overwhelmingly agrarian, and these peasants of the poorer interior provinces—Henan,、uh, Hubei, Anhui, Jiangxi, Shanxi—their world was a million miles away from the goings-on along the coast and in the treaty port areas. So to think that all this Western technology and learning was going to propel China forward to the level of the foreign powers was was just a major pipe dream. Whatever gains. Or baby steps China might make in, in lifting themselves out of the old world and into the new, the West would just keep moving forward in leaps and bounds. And the lead never seemed to narrow; it just kept getting wider. There were a number of reasons why the the whole self-strengthening movement never really met with success. 
most China scholars all conclude that it was doomed from the start by the earliest proponents, like uh, Zheng Guofan, Li Hongzhang, Zhang Zhidong, and others within the Qing government who all viewed the matter of self-strengthening and modernization within the context of the Qing government and its conservative Confucian systems. No thought was given to actually reforming the wheels of government and ushering in any substantive changes there. It was commonly thought that the Qing government would serve as a partner in all this reform to the country's economy and education. The Qing dynasty focused all their efforts instead on self-preservation through appeasement with foreigners and buying weapons to suppress rebellions and whatever, and then coming down hard on whatever discontent might flare up. The foreign powers saw the Qing dynasty was totally dependent on them for survival. The foreign nations making fortunes in China were of the mind that Keeping the status quo was just fine with them. As long as there was no talk about making any changes to the government, the reformers had Cixi Taiho's support. But if they ever crossed that line, the Empress Dowager pushed back very hard. And as long as these reforms still kept the Qing dynasty in power, they would get their complete lukewarm support. You see, Cixi sort of seized power in a coup in 1861. Her husband, the Xianfeng Emperor, he dies in 1861, probably of a broken heart at all the bad luck during his reign. So his son, uh, who becomes the Tongzhi Emperor, uh, he's all of five years old. The Xianfeng Emperor made some arrangements prior to his death that basically gave the orders for how everything was supposed to be handled during the Tongzhi Emperor's minority. On the one hand, you had a, uh, a regency council of eight ministers put together, and uh, to act as a counterbalance, the two empress dowagers, Cixi Xi and Cixi An, were also given authority. But these two sides, these, these ministers and the two empresses, they were natural rivals. And Cixi Xi, being the shrewd, power-hungry lady that she was, she engineered the Xinyo Zhengbian the Xinyo Palace Coup of November 1861. Basically, she cleverly used her two allies, Prince Gong and Prince Chun, to help her to seize power. And as the famous story goes, after the funeral of the emperor, she rushed back to the capital a day early, ahead of the eight other co-regents, and engineered this whole coup, and just as Saddam Hussein did to his rivals in 1979, the Empress Dowager Cixi, had them all declared guilty of treason, and they were removed from power and executed. Again, this was all facilitated by Cixi and her partners in crime, Princes Gong and Chun. Prince Gong, Gong Qinwang, he was the Xianfeng Emperor's brother. His son would have been the first choice to take over as emperor, but he was a wastrel and not suitable, so it went to Prince Chun. Prince Chun, Chun Xian Qinwang, was the seventh son of the Daoguang Emperor and father of the Guangxu Emperor. This meant that the Empress Dowager was his sister-in-law. Both men were major insiders in Qing politics during this time. So from that point in November 1861 until the day she died in November 1908 at the age of 72, the Empress Dowager Cixi was the de facto ruler in China. She'll sort of flit in and out of our story, our sad story about how the self-strengthening movement sort of crashed and burned. But this self-strengthening movement and Qing restoration gave the dying dynasty a new lease on life. After these rebellions, order was restored out in the provinces, the government bureaucracy just came back to life, and men of talent came to the fore, and the traditional ways came back, and everything started to return to normal after more than a decade of sheer chaos. Westernization was being explored and all this foreign know-how and technology, machines, weapons of mass destruction, well, for that time at least, these all poured into China during the 1860s. And to deal with the foreigners, a separate office was created known as the Zhongli Yaman. This was the office that was charged with dealing with anything related to foreigners. It was a famously inefficient and slow-moving office of the government. The important thing in setting up the Zhongli Yaman was to keep these foreigners away from the imperial palace and the emperor. By all means, the imperial court preferred not to get their hands dirty dealing with the pushy westerners who never cared a hoot about protocol or 
Chinese sensibilities. Well, the leaders of this Qing restoration and the self-strengthening, they weren't what you might call savvy about how a modern economy worked. A lot of what was going on with the modernization was happening out in the provinces rather than in Beijing itself. And these Confucian bureaucrats who ran the day-to-day affairs of the government, they dragged their feet all day and all night when it came to helping out and all these commercial endeavors. And there wasn't a lot of respect and admiration the Confucianists had for the merchant classes, and they had even less enthusiasm when it came to matters of foreign trade or investment. This whole thing really didn't work out the way it was hoped. From the safety and comfort of a century and a half later, we can see that the objective of self-strengthening was to revive the past glory of the Qing rather than building a brave new world. The whole matter of how to incorporate all of this westernization to such a traditional society as China, just it just couldn't be reconciled. And in the end, the conservative faction at court won out. They were able to keep their foot on the brake to the extent that all these hoped-for plans were never achieved. The civil servants, the literati, the gentry, and of course the imperial court all viewed these new ideas and westernization with a great deal of suspicion and refused to offer their true support. Their objective was to preserve the Confucian traditions that had been around since the spring and autumn period that ended in 479 B.C., The entirety of the 1860s saw a wave of anti-foreign feelings sweep China. There were a number of reasons, the missionaries and the 101 ways they rubbed the Chinese the wrong way, the Treaty of Nanjing and Tianjin and the way the foreigners were always seeming to get whatever they demanded and the government impotent and relying on appeasement to live to fight another day. The finest hour during the Qing Restoration sort of lived and died with the defeat of all the rebellions. It seemed like there might have been enough momentum to keep it going, but by the 1870s, the whole movement sort of ran out of gas. The Empress Dowager Cixi gave it her outward support, but she was also supporting the conservative faction as well, and she you know, manipulated everything excellently to the point where the status quo was well-preserved. The 1860s saw an explosion of commerce and economic activity. Back in the early days, it was all about the usual suspects, tea, silk, chinaware, opium. Now it was all about the China market. When you look at the stage of development the Western powers were at, and you put that power to work inside China, building all the machines that pumped out all the daily use goods and Western things that meshed perfectly with the demands of the day in Chinese society. Factories sprung up like mushrooms everywhere there was a treaty port. Some were Western controlled, some Chinese controlled. A whole lot of technology and marketing concepts, processing, all kinds of useful things that the West brought to China as far as manufacturing innovations go were studied by the local entrepreneurs. And when you took all these new production, mining, transportation innovations, and you you mixed it with that natural Chinese talent for absorbing the info and molding it perfectly to the needs of their market. I mean, it was just a great mixture. And of course, whatever great ideas introduced in Hankou or Shanghai or Tianjin or Singapore or Hong Kong would spread quickly throughout the entire network of Chinese diaspora who had already fanned out across Southeast Asia and now into North America and Europe. So the Western powers were all clamoring for their little piece of the action in post-Treaty of Tianjin 1860s China. They fought against many of the restrictions and internal transit duties, or Li Jin. This was a tax put in effect during the Taiping Rebellion that served to raise funds for all these necessary local armies to fight the rebels. The central government had no money, so power was given to the local authorities to use this Li Jin system. After the Taiping Rebellion, it stayed in effect, and this was how local governments raised revenue. Basically, foreigners saw it as an obstruction to commerce that made them either uncompetitive or kept them out of some sectors of the China market. Today, everyone's giving China constant pressure regarding the RMB, claiming it's unfairly undervalued. Well, well, 150 years ago, foreigners were still saying the same thing, only instead of the RMB, it was the Li Jin, or the, or the Lycan tax, as it was also called. The foreigners kept the pressure up to get rid of these Li Jin, but it stuck around till 1931. Now, right at this time in the 1860s, just as the Westerners are expanding into China, there's a popular anti-foreign groundswell that starts to form. Once the Treaty of Tianjin was signed, it 
busted China wide open to the work of the missionaries, the dynamic created in societies where you had missionaries setting up shop caused all kinds of societal problems. In addition to the sincere local populace who found attraction to Christianity, there were also plenty of pretenders who used the missionaries and that little bit of magic, or whatever you want to call it, that always seemed to give foreigners special treatment within China's society. Local governments found them offensive, not to mention a dangerous threat to their power. And of course, the whole Taiping Rebellion, with its Christian angle, this wasn't a good advertisement for Christianity amongst the Chinese populace. So naturally, there rose up also troublemakers here and there who would spread all these nasty rumors about all these diabolical things foreign missionaries were doing to innocent Chinese Lao Bai Xing. The most vile rumors and lies would be disseminated wherever missionaries would do their work. Some things never change, and this trick of spreading rumors in society is as alive today as it was back then. There were plenty of incidents of violence against missionaries, but one in particular sort of rose to the fore and became a lightning rod for all this pent-up anti-foreign sentiment lurking just below the surface. It happened in Tianjin in June of 1870, and this flare-up involved the Catholic Church there and the French who ran it as well as a local orphanage. Well, Word got out amongst the hoi polloi that these French priests and nuns were using these Chinese kids, were dropped off at the orphanage for all kinds of ritual sacrifices. So the Tianjin government sends someone over to check out the situation, but nothing's found. The French consul gets wind of this and blows his stack, storms into the local yamen in Tianjin that handled matters regarding foreigners, and he he started doing that that thing that foreigners do that simply drive Chinese crazy. He got aggressive, loud, spoke in accusatory tones, and it reached a crescendo, and he pulls out a gun, and a policeman or someone at the scene gets shot and killed. So in the passion of the moment, the crowd that had gathered, they ripped this guy to pieces, and now the Qing government has a full-blown international incident on their hands involving them, the French, and all the world's Catholics. In addition to the death of this diplomat, there were also many nuns, priests, and other innocent victims of the French persuasion who are murdered by this mob uprising. This Tianjin massacre, as it has come down to us, was uh, followed up by a bunch of burning and looting to other French institutions in Tianjin. So the government sends in Tsung Guofan to deal with this, and thankfully the French were suddenly too preoccupied with the Franco-Prussian War, so the damage wasn't too bad. However, the damage done to the reputation of the Qing emperor in the eyes of the foreign community were greatly diminished. Tsung Guofan died in 1872, and once he is gone, the most venerable, sacred cow in the government to deal with foreigners became Li Hongzhang. Besides the damage done to the overall relationship between China and the West that came as a result of the missionary movement, there was also the matter of the treaty negotiated in Beijing, signed by the British minister to China, Rutherford Alcock, and representatives from the Zongli Yamen. All sides seemed happy with this renegotiated version of the Treaty of Tianjin, but the so-called Old China Hands, the oldest and most established British traders in the China game, they didn't think this treaty went far enough, and they used the politicians they had in their pockets back in London to make sure the treaty was never ratified by Parliament. Both Prince Gong and Li Hongzhang were personally involved in these renegotiations that were a little more reasonable for the Chinese side, so it ends up getting rejected, and Li Hongzhang and Prince Gong are undermined and lose face. Meanwhile, back in the capital, the unholy alliance between the two empresses, Dowager Cixi and Cixan, and Prince Gong was getting quite strained. In 1873, the Tongzhi Emperor reaches his majority, and the need for this regency ends. But one thing about the Tongzhi Emperor, he was not destined for a good end, and he died of smallpox in January 1875 at the age of 18. This boy emperor had lived a notoriously promiscuous life, regularly visiting brothels and mixing with lowlifes. That he died this young was hardly surprising. Now, this sudden death presented a major dilemma. This is where the Empress Dowager makes her move, and she seizes absolute power and goes against one of the holiest of holy traditions regarding the matter of succession and puts her nephew on the throne, who becomes the Emperor Guangxu. And conveniently, the Guangxu Emperor is merely five years old, so of course he's going to need a regency. So... 
Cixi Taihou is set for the foreseeable future. 1881, Empress Dowager Cixi An died mysteriously, and in 1884, Cixi had Prince Gong dismissed, which leaves her the last man standing from the original regency put in place at the commencement of the Tongzhi era. In 1884 85, you had the Sino French War. This war was all about kicking the French out of China's on again, off again ally, Vietnam, where they were setting up their own little colony. The French had sort of carved out their own little world down there. French Catholic missionaries had been scratching around Vietnam since the Ming Dynasty. That's why Catholicism sort of took hold down there more than Protestantism. The Nguyen Dynasty appealed to the Qing Emperor, who they still pay tribute to, to come on down and help them out of this jam with the French. After mercenaries called the Black Flags were sent down in 1882 to shake things up a little, the scholar and general Zhang Zhidong, also governor general of Guangdong and Guangxi, leads his forces against the French. And thanks in part to Li Hongzhang refusing to send reinforcements to the south, and also thanks to the superiority of the French navy, he goes down in defeat. On August 23, 1884, the French navy blows the Fuzhou shipyard to smithereens, and the 11 newest and best warships purchased by the Qing navy were destroyed. So good old Li Hongzhang gets sent down there to negotiate as best he could, under the circumstances, that is, he had tried to work something out with the French before it came to blows, but Cixi, the Empress Dowager, decided to declare war on France instead. So as a result of this misadventure, in 1885, the French were granted what amounted to a free hand in Vietnam, and China couldn't do anything about it. But, as we all know, the French will have their own mess on their hands come the middle of the 20th century, which ultimately becomes our problem, but that's not what this podcast is all about. So, in 1885, we can see the seeds planted for the Vietnam War 80 years later. And so we come to one of the blackest, most humiliating, most difficult events in modern Chinese history. This was the Sino-Japanese War of 1894-1895. I was thinking of doing a show later on to explore the roots of Sino-Japanese mutual distrust and, well, in a lot of cases, downright hatred. Between the Sino-Japanese War that we're about to discuss, Japanese invasions and brutal treatment of Chinese in the 30s and 40s, World War II and the occupation, not to mention the 21 demands that came in 1915 and then leaving China completely and totally in the dust as far as post-World War II economic reform and industrialization go, I mean, even today... In 2011, the enmity felt by common Chinese against Japan is still present. Even young people today, born a century and decades after the fact, still harbor a burning distrust and sometimes a downright hatred for Japan. Of course, this doesn't cover all Chinese, but in my personal experience, I haven't met a lot of Chinese who, consumer products aside, have uh, much good things to say about Japan. As we all know, Commodore Perry paid his historic visit to Japan in 1853, and things were never the same again there. And we all know the story how Japan embraced modernization and the Meiji Emperor became a major proponent of all this rapid industrialization, militarization, and economic reform. In China, it was just the opposite, mostly because they lacked a leader like the Meiji Emperor who would push these reforms through from the top down. Rather than a Meiji Emperor type, the Qing Dynasty was stuck with the anti-reformer, Cixi Taihou. For this reason alone, the Empress Dowager is vilified today in China. We don't even have to get into the other reasons. The Japanese watched and waited. They, of course, were cognizant of the treaties of Nanjing and Tianjin. They knew how the foreigners had sacked Beijing and burned the Summer Palace. They saw all this happening, and then, of course, in 1868, the Tokugawa shogunate was overthrown, and you had the Meiji Restoration... So as a result of embracing all the useful things the West could offer in terms of technology, industrial production, organizing the military, and how to do battle, the Japanese by 1880 posed the greatest potential threat to China. And in addition to all this, the Japanese also kept their eyes and ears open and received a quick seat-of-the-pants education in the ways of Western-style international diplomacy. So by 1880, Japan is cocked and loaded, and China is still trying to figure out the whole westernization thing and how to integrate these foreign ways into their world. In September of 1871, eight months after the creation of this new country in Europe called the German Empire, Japan and China sign a western-style treaty of equality and reciprocity. 
China essentially recognizes Japan as a sovereign nation and no longer puts on any airs that Japan is a vassal state. Both sides promise to come to each other's aid if either one is attacked by another third party, but this is early in the 1870s and all this supposed goodwill dies pretty fast. So after the ink dries on this treaty, Japan goes and claims Liuqiu and Korea. The Liuqiu Islands are an archipelago sort of halfway between Japan and Taiwan. These are better known to those that are in the know as the Ryukyu Islands. Now, these islands had always paid tribute to China, and at times there was actual Chinese administration there. Well, not anymore. There was a lot of grumbling in Beijing about this. You know, Japan took advantage of China, who at the time was all tied up in Xinjiang and with Russia, so they, so they can't do anything about it. And in 1879, Japan makes Okinawa a prefecture. Okinawa is one of the islands of this chain. As for Korea, Japan was anxious to make sure the Russians didn't have any ideas to possibly use Korea as a pathway into Manchuria. The Big Bear to the north around the 1860s, 1870s was becoming increasingly aggressive out in the Asian part of the country. As we know later, Japan has its own designs on Manchuria, so they had to make sure the Russians didn't do anything to preempt their plans. So, in 1875, the Japanese provoked an incident on the Han River in Seoul, and the upshot is the Treaty of Kanghua in 1876, which gives Japan certain commercial privileges in Korea and declared Korea an independent and sovereign state who didn't have to pay any more tribute to the Qing Emperor. So that was a nice little kick in the teeth to China. In 1879, the emperor puts Li Hongzhang in charge of this whole matter of Japan and what was going on in Korea. In December 1884, Japan backs a coup in Korea. Li Hongzhang sends troops, and Japan sends Ito Hirabumi to Tianjin to negotiate. He and Li Hongzhang find a way to throw cold water on this to calm things down in 1885. By the way, Li Hongzhang's personal representative in Korea at this time is none other than Yuan Shikai, who later becomes China's second president after the passing of Sun Yat-sen. But that's way, way in the future. He plays a major role in the final death throes of the Qing dynasty, 1911-1912. So anyway, back in Korea, China then attempts to encourage multinational imperialism in Korea to counter everything Japan was doing over there. Li Hongzhang figured better to have all the imperialist powers competing in Korea than to just leave everything to Japan. Japan was far away, but Korea was right on the border with Manchuria. In the spring of 1894, a domestic disturbance in Korea, the Tonghak Rebellion, led to the government inviting Qing military forces into Korea to help put this revolt down. This particular revolt in Korea was very similar to the Taiping Rebellion, its nature. But the Japanese said, whoa, hold on a second, if you're sending troops, then so am I. So the Japanese Diet votes to send a reciprocal force to Korea to deal with this matter. And, of course, there's no way to avoid the inevitable. Japan had their eyes on Korea for a long time, and now was the time to strike. They doubted China's military, as big as it looked. So there was a confrontation. And the Japanese forces took control of the Imperial Palace in Seoul on June 8, 1894, and they installed a Japanese puppet government there. The Chinese didn't accept this, but the troops there, led by Yuan Shikai, were outnumbered and outmaneuvered by the Japanese. So they head back to China to regroup. Now the stage is set for the next huge debacle in China's sad 19th century history. Now the Japanese Navy, modeled after the British Navy, preeminent in the world, was going to face off against the formidable Beiyang Navy, the jewel in the crown of China's naval forces. The Qing rulers sort of looked at this as a regional matter that should have been handled by Li Hongzhang's forces based around there. To the Japanese, this was a national matter between Japan and China. But China's leaders at the time, they were sort of preoccupied with Central Asia and the efforts of Zhou Zongtang over there. So Li Hongzhang's Anhui Army and Beiyang Navy sort of got left in the lurch, so to speak. In July, Japan sends their entire joint naval fleet towards Korea to deal with the inevitable. In the same month, the Japanese seize the emperor, and he's forced to basically set up this pro-Japanese government, sort of like a proto-Manchukuo. In September 1894, after no success anywhere, Li's army was routed at Pyongyang, and then on the 17th of that month, the Chinese Beiyang Navy was annihilated. 
This was a date, my friend, that for show will live in infamy in the annals of Chinese history. There, the Chinese Navy went down hard at the mouth of the Yalu River. After that, the Japanese, perhaps heady from such easy victories, they push into Manchuria. MacArthur wasn't the first one to cross the Yalu River into China in modern times. Between October 1894 and February 1895, the Japanese took Manchuria, the Liaodong Peninsula, where Dalian is located, as well as Port Arthur, known as Lushunko. The last port seized was in Weihai Wei in Shandong. In March, the Pescadores Islands near Taiwan were invaded and seized. The Qing garrison that backed up Taiwan was based in the Pescadores, so this effectively lost Taiwan to the Japanese later on in the dreaded Ma Guan Tiaoye, or the Treaty of Shimonoseki. Prince Gong, long out of favor, he comes back and he gets the dirty job to go negotiate with the Japanese and find a way to extract China from this terribly embarrassing debacle. And what we end up with, as I said, is the Treaty of Shimonoseki. Shimonoseki is located right at the very tip of Hanshu in Yamaguchi Prefecture. There, on April 17th, 1895, China signed their face away to their upstart rival going all the way back to the Han Dynasty. It was a terribly humiliating and degrading treaty to a government that had already taken quite a beating from the British, the French, and from internal forces. And now it was Japan's turn to pile on top. Indeed, it was bad enough that China had suffered these defeats to the British and the French. These were Western people from lands far away. And it was easy to explain it all off and say, well, these Western nations, their economic and industrial development took a different path than China. And while it made the pain no less severe, at least China could say, well, it was different. These guys developed quicker and taught us a lesson. But one day, you know, but with Japan, it was totally different. Historically, China had always been the big brother in this relationship. Many aspects of Japanese culture that were part of the very essence of being Japanese, a lot of this initially came from China. So all these years later, with Japan so savagely and suddenly defeating China, this was very, very hard to take. When Li Hongzhang was in Japan negotiating this treaty, he narrowly missed death in an assassination attempt from some Japanese extremists. So thanks to that loss of face, Japan had to tone down their demands. But still, if you were a great nation with a history thousands of years old, admired and respected around the world for your achievements, inventions, empire, and culture, and you have to go sign your name to the following provisions, what would you be thinking? First of all, Korea was declared an independent nation, but in actuality, it was a puppet state of Japan. And then 15 years later, Japan simply annexed Korea. Second, Taiwan was lost to Japan and stayed part of Japan until 1945. That's why when you visit Japan, you'll see many old folks born in the 20s and 30s who are still living. They can speak Japanese. Taiwan had just become a province in its own right in 1885. Up till then, it had always simply been another prefecture of Fujian province. So 10 years after Taiwan becomes a province, it falls into Japanese hands. China had to pay a crippling indemnity to Japan of 200 million taels, an unheard of amount in China certainly didn't have this kind of coin sitting around. What we'll see is the Qing government had to go into hock to European bankers who financed this indemnity, and they had to pay this indemnity over seven years. And then the one thing denied to Western businessmen up till now, Japan was allowed to set up factories in the interior of China. The existing treaty said any factories had to be near or at a treaty port. Now, Japan could plunge right into the heart and soul of China, to the Neidi areas, far from the coasts. They started off in Chongqing, Hangzhou, Suzhou, and Shashi in Hubei. And then believe me, once Japan started setting up factories all over the interior of China, the foreign powers followed suit, and to hell with what China thought about that. Once the Treaty of Shimonoseki was signed, and the international community knew how weak China truly was... The age of economic imperialism took off on afterburner. In addition to Taiwan, China also had to give up the Pescadores and the eastern part of the Liaodong Peninsula. So that was the Sino-Japanese War. 
So much for all the time and money spent on the self-strengthening movement. Up till now, starting with the first opium war, China had sort of been shocked little by little. But now, after going down in such ignoble defeat to Japan, it was like someone headbutted China and woke the government up to the necessity to finally take measures to strengthen the country for real. At least we'll see the start of a constitutional movement. Sadly, the news spread amongst the Chinese populace that funds airmarked to upgrade the Beiyang fleet and supply all the vessels with ammo and provisions during the Sino-Japanese War were diverted instead to the building of Cixi's little pleasure palace, the Yihayuan. Rather than the real boats, these funds were used in part to build Cixi's famous marble boat, the infamous Shifang. In total, about 36 million taels, or $50 million, was diverted. So when it comes time to face off against the Japanese in 1894, there were plenty of weapons, but not enough ammo. And then, as the story goes, many of the shells used by the Beiyang fleet against the Japanese navy were filled with sand instead of gunpowder. How's that for irony? Li Hongzhang never lived this down because he was in cahoots with the Empress Dowager about this and has not been judged kindly by historians who excoriated him for his complicity in this whole sidebar to the Sino-Japanese War. Now, this treaty also had a bad smell to it from the Russian perspective, too. Having the Japanese in Manchuria was not what the Russians wanted, so they team up with the French and Germans to lean on Tokyo, and the Japanese back down, and they get out of Manchuria, but they pocket an extra 50 million tails for the trouble. Germany, which was still called Prussia in those days, had started poking their nose around China since the 1860s. They set their sights on Jiaozhou, just outside of Qingdao, in Shandong, in 1897, Germany uses a violent incident involving German priests to force China to sign a 99-year lease, which effectively gave Qingdao to Germany. And so Shandong province became a German sphere of influence. And we'll see, in 1903, some German settlers emigrate to Qingdao and set up a bear factory, which today sells over $3 billion a year of Qingdao Pijo, or Tsingtao Bear, as it's also known as. So all the animals come to feed at the trough now. Russia sidles up and helps themselves to Port Arthur, or Liu Xun, as well as the port city of Dalian, and in no time at all, they start colonizing the place. And parts today still have that pre-Soviet Russian look and feel to it. Great Britain seizes Wei Hai Wei and demands the same deal there that the Russians got with Dalian. And on top of that, the British needed more elbow room in Hong Kong, so they signed a 99-year lease with China for the new territories. That was the vast expanse of land between Kowloon and the border of Guangdong. This lease of the new territories in Hong Kong was to run out on July 1st, 1997. Of course, when this time rolled around, China had staged the comeback of the century, so they took all of Hong Kong rather than just the uh, leased new territories. Fortunately for posterity, my countrymen sort of didn't look as bad. The United States had its hands full in the Philippines, so they didn't participate in the early rush to carve out spheres of influence in China. So China was sort of carved up. Russia's sphere was in Manchuria. Germany had the Shandong Peninsula. The Yangtze River Valley was predominantly Anglo-French. Fujian, and across the strait in Taiwan, was Japan's sphere of influence. And in southeast China, near the Vietnam border, the French held sway. And part of all these behind-closed-doors agreements with all these foreign powers came the mineral rights to mine in these regions, uh, railroad construction, and whatever else that was open to plunder. So bad was all the grabbing that was going on, it was feared that China might ultimately devolve into another Africa, partitioned up into all these foreign-controlled territories. Believe it or not, the railroads were not very popular, even within the leadership. Zheng Guofan said of the railroads being built by the foreigners that they disrupted feng shui, disturbed the spirits of the ancestors, transported too many foreigners around, and put untold numbers of coolies and cart drivers out of business. And so we're going to end our tale of woe right here in the afterglow of the Treaty of Shimonoseki of April 1895. The Qing Dynasty has 17 more years to go yet, but as we can see, it's been one downhill battle since the late 1700s, and now it's come to this. 
There isn't a single instance when China ever has the upper hand with the foreign powers. If everything was like a game of poker, China never had better than a pair of twos. They were hopelessly in debt to the Western banks who financed the Sino-Japanese war indemnity, as well as all the railroad construction, ships, and infrastructure projects. Anti-Manchu, anti-Qing dynasty elements in China were having a field day pointing fingers at the government for their weaknesses and failures to stand up to the foreigners. Now the seeds of nationalism were starting to sprout. There's nothing like a good humiliation or perceived insult from a foreign power to feed the flames of nationalism amongst the people. Guys like Li Hongzhang and Zheng Guofan were later vilified for what they gave away to the Western powers. Li Hongzhang, in his frustration, was quoted once replying to the Japanese Prime Minister Ito Hirabumi in 1884 when asked why Japan succeeded and China failed. He said, Affairs in my country have been so confined by tradition that I could not accomplish what I desired. I am ashamed of having excessive wishes and lacking power to fulfill them. This whole era is still resonating loud and clear today. So China's leaders must never at any cost be seen in the same light of giving in to unreasonable foreign demands or demands that are perceived to be unreasonable by the Zhongguo Lao Baixing, the Chinese people. So when you see some of the strong statements coming out of Beijing these days in the 21st century, the ghosts of the 1890s are all over the place. So next week, we'll pick up in 1898 when the Guangxu Emperor, remember him? He was four years old when he became emperor in 1875. Well, now he's reached his majority and he's going to try and assert himself, but his aunt, the Empress Dowager, is going to put the kibosh on all that. But that's for next time. For now... This is your host, Laszlo Montgomery, once again thanking you for downloading this episode of the China History Podcast. It's been a cold, gray, and drizzly week for us here in Claremont, California. I definitely picked the wrong week to pour a new driveway. Still wet after seven days, but we have a solid week of 80s and 90s and nothing but sun starting tomorrow, so I'm sure I'll be able to enjoy that inaugural drive onto my new improved driveway soon. Take care, everyone. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next week, I hope, for another exciting edition of the China History Podcast.